Hello, this is Patrick Cauley with Keystone Elder Law. This is Keynotes, a series of conversations with people about issues affecting the elderly, those with special needs, and veterans. I am joined today by Kelly Coons of Acera Care Hospice. Kelly, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me, Patrick. So tell me how and, and why you got into this field of service working for a hospice provider. Um, so I was actually working in a skilled facility and there was a woman who was on hospice services and I didn't necessarily understand what all of that meant. So um, I, I learned as the process went on and she just had a little special place in my heart. So one morning I went in to check on her just to see how she was, if she made it through the night. And I realized that, you know, she, she um, was looking like she was towards the very end. So I had the nurse call hospice and they came in and I was able to sit there with her um, while, she, while she passed and, and moved on to the next stage. And I was able to hold her hand and pray with her and just let her know that somebody was there with her and she wasn't alone. And I don't know why I did that, but it was something I just felt compelled to do. And I came home that night and I remember saying to my husband, I need to do this. I need to get into hospice. And here I am. That sounds like an incredible moment, life-changing for you, but also uh, really changed that uh, significant moment in the life of that, that woman as well. So that's, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, um, I hope so. so. I think people have a general sense of hospice being something that happens at the end of life, but they don't know much more about it. Uh, could you just tell us generally, what is hospice care? What is palliative care? And are there differences between the two? Okay, sure. Um, so hospice and palliative care, they are different, but they are similar. So palliative care is when somebody, for example, has, has a cancer diagnosis and they would like to receive treatment, even though that cancer may not be curative. Um, but the, the goal is always comfort, but then it's to move on to hospice. So hospice is when somebody says, okay, I realize I don't have a curative, um, something curative and I'm not going to seek aggressive treatment. So the goal there would be comfort. And that's where hospice steps in. And um, that's what we get to do. We get to make sure people are comfortable at the end of life and we have quality over quantity. That's a, a pretty significant shift from, you know, all the money in our healthcare system that goes to uh, saving or prolonging life and making that shift uh, both in, in mindset and also in the resources being used um, to, to make a person comfortable. And so how does, that, how does that start? How does the conversation start with the patient or uh, with the patient's family to, to consider hospice care? Um, typically, the conversation starts because somebody brings it to their attention, whether they've been hospitalized or at the physician's office. Um, but it's always great to start that conversation sooner. People think hospice is just end-of-life care, which it is end-of-life care, but end-of-life doesn't have to mean tomorrow or next week. Hospice is a six-month benefit. So we like to look at, okay, starting the conversation sooner so you can start hospice sooner and receive those benefits for a longer period of time. And what that means is your loved one is going to get that additional hands-on uh, help that they need and deserve and to make sure everything towards their end of life goes comfortably and to make sure we become part of their family and everyone understands what the goal is and that we can make sure even after somebody passes, you've met our social worker and our bereavement coordinator. So when these people do reach out, you already know who they are and have built a relationship. That's great. I, I never realized that you encourage that conversation about hospice to start ideally well before it's needed. Um, it, that's in many ways that mirrors the conversation that I have with clients at Keystone Elder Law, which is to make plans well before you need it because you never know uh, what curveballs life will throw you. Uh, you know, we plan not just for what happens to a person's property after they pass away, but much more importantly, what happens if you become incapacitated during your life. So in, in particular, I'm thinking of the healthcare power of attorney and living will that make up an advanced directive. And so it's a similar conversation where you're talking about uh, what kind of, of care, how aggressive do you want the care to be if a doctor determines that 
you could be in an end stage situation where the chances of coming back are remote. And so it's the same kind of conversation. The sooner it happens, uh, the better, especially because it's not an easy conversation for many families to have. Um, but it sounds like you have a whole team assembled to have that conversation. You just, you mentioned a bereavement coordinator and social workers. So, uh, so they, they would be meeting a team of professionals at Acera Care. Correct. Um, hospice is a whole team approach. Um, so we have everyone from our own medical director, who ours is Dr. Eric Barr. He's located in York. And then we have our director of our agency, who is an RN, who has been with us for over 15 years and our patient care manager who reaches out to help with the scheduling and explaining of benefits, insurances. She's been with us for over 12 years. So we really have a great longevity with our team. But on top of just that, we have our, our marketers, which is myself and my partner, Jen, and we have social workers, uh, spiritual care coordinators, uh, home health aides. They are such a big part of this organization and, and of hospice and um, you know, we just have this whole team approach that we're all there for the patient and we're there as much or as little as you, as you need. That is really incredible because I think maybe if you go back 20 to 30 years, these end of life um, conversations and the end of life treatment was a lot less complicated. If you think before there were stents to keep blood vessels open or, or uh, medications that have advanced so much. Uh, to deal with, uh, I guess, critical situations like heart disease. You know, death came quicker then. And now that people are living longer, I think having that multidisciplinary approach really um, is appropriate for the, the complicated conversations and needs of somebody who is living longer and wants to be comfortable in their final, uh, final months and days. I agree, yes. Um, there's a great resource. Uh, it is fivewishes.org. And it is a great pamphlet that it was put together to just go over uh, kind of similar end of life wishes, but it could be more, the conversation is more of a, do you prefer to have music played? What type of music do you prefer? Do you want to, to be in a hospital? Would you prefer to be at home? Um, so it, the conversation is, is much easier because you're not necessarily talking about just death, but you're talking about your wishes and what you want to have um, at that time. So it's a great resource. People can look up the website. That's great. Another place that I was looking at before our conversation was the website of the Hospice Foundation of America, which is hospicefoundation.org. And they just have some tabs that you can click on everything from a basic description of what hospice is, which is what we're discussing, uh, to I guess, grief resources and, and things to work through there. I'm sure Asera Care offers the same sorts of uh, information uh, to the public to, to, to start thinking about these important aspects of uh, end of life care. Absolutely, we actually just rebranded. So we have a whole new website and our website is www.aseracare.com. And you can go on there and we have blog posts now. So you can read about um, maybe different topics. We are very um, involved in the We Honor Veterans program. So we have some blogs on the We Honor Veterans. Um, I myself have written a blog about the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization in Washington, D.C., which I'm a part of. So there's multiple different resources there. You can look up uh, each agency individually. You can even make a referral through our website. That's fantastic. And I, because you know, that's first of all, to have both the written blogs as well as, um, you know, I know you uh, are, are doing videos, not just this one. It's, you know, we're learning more and more about how people process information and some people are visual learners and some people want to hear it. Um, so just to get the word out in as many ways as possible is, is really admirable. Um, and, and you have to, because I think that there are certain myths that you have to overcome uh, uh, as far as hospice goes, uh, to to uh, educate people about really what it is and and why they should be talking about it with their family members, you know. So for some people, I think they they hear hospice and they think, well, that's just throwing in the towel and giving up, as opposed to uh, reaching a different mindset, one of acceptance, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of of having quality time with the family. Um, you know, another myth that I that I had heard uh, discussed was that 
people think it will speed up the dying process. And, and, you know, I don't know, maybe some might even consider it like euthanasia, but it's nothing like that at all. I believe you even told me about a study that showed that people who were on hospice ended up living longer than those who did not go through hospice care. Correct. There was a study done a few years ago and it uh, just took a group of people. And what they found was people that, um, utilize their hospice benefit actually lived um, up to 20 days longer because they were getting the, the care and services they need. So they were getting the spiritual care and they were getting the hands-on care. Um, now, I am not aware if this was for primarily home patients versus patients that are in a skilled uh, facility, but I personally know when somebody is an, at home and you know maybe the caregiver has a little burnout or maybe they're just not sure what they're doing or they think they're doing everything right when really we could we could make things a lot easier for them and that's where our team steps in and they're able to assist in the bathing process assist in how to easier uh, get them from a bed to a chair and just little things like that that makes such a big difference in their life that's great um, I think that one of the other questions that people often have is is how do you pay for hospice care and I know that's come up in our practice meeting with clients. And I, I try to tell them, you know, this is not something that's only available uh, to the elite or to people who have a lot of money. Although, you know, if some people do private pay for, for hospice care, I suppose, but Medicare covers it. Even if, you know, the, and then I'm talking about the traditional Medicare, even if you have a Medicare Advantage plan, uh, Medicare still covers it. Medicaid covers it for, for people who qualify for Medicaid uh, for various healthcare services. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, I think even um, TRICARE for military families has hospice benefits and even in private in insurance plans that uh, one might have through an employer will often have a hospice benefit and it's just a matter of figuring out uh, how much it covers. But um, it, I don't know how often you, you encounter that, that people worry, you know, or they think, well, I can't afford hospice. Uh, I think even, you know, I've seen lots of charity events to raise money for hospice. So I suppose that even if there's somebody who's medically eligible for hospice care, but they can't pay for it, the resources will be there one way or the other. Absolutely, hospice is built into to the benefit and you're correct, Medicare, Medicaid is completely covered. Um, veterans benefits, uh, sometimes they can be worded a little different, but that is all stuff we look into as soon as we, we learn of the referral, we will reach into that and we will find all that information out before we even call the family member because we want to have that information before we call. Um, private insurances, most private insurances do have it built in. Sometimes there is a copay or a deductible that needs met. But like I said, these are all things we research before we call the family so we can give them the exact information. That's great. Uh, Kelly, you mentioned your association with an organization in D.C., so I understand you've uh, taken on the, the difficult task of educating Congress about hospice matters. That's, uh, that's a challenge, having worked in a legislative environment, um, I know how that can be. Tell us what kind of work you've done there and what the, the issues have involved. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm part of the NHPCO. I am an ambassador in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, currently I'm the only ambassador in Pennsylvania and so that means I got to go down to Washington DC, meet with different congressmen and try and discuss with them uh, the importance of hospice and palliative care and things that uh, we have, would like to have put in place and we would like to you know, have a law made and discussing with them, having that difficult conversation of trying to you know, get a congressman to agree with you um, so it's been very educational on, on their part, but also on mine. And uh, we look forward to doing more things, to opening up uh, more things for seniors in the hospice and palliative care organization. But currently they, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at other things right now, especially with all the PPE and everything going in the pandemic. So uh, we look forward to speaking more about them in the fall. Sure, that's great. And, you know, the progress has been made in the federal government. I, there was a time when, uh, you know, the, the, the time that's necessary for, for example, a physician to have an end of life conversation with a patient just wasn't, you know, they, they weren't taking that time because they weren't getting paid for that time. And, the, you know, the, every, all the financial incentives meant that the physician had to move on to the next patient. But eventually there were changes in uh, Medicare and Medicaid to 
allow for that conversation to mm -hmm. take the time that is necessary to, uh, because it, it ends up being cost effective if you want to look at it in dollars and cents, but it's, it's good for the patient, it's good for the healthcare system for end of life decisions to get the kind of attention from uh, healthcare professionals that it really deserves. So I don't know if you played a role in that, but we'll just go ahead and give you credit for that major <laughs> expansion uh, in Medicare and Medicaid. So um, where is Care, and how can people get in touch with you and with Care? So Care, um, we, we are a nationwide company and we have multiple agencies throughout Pennsylvania. So we cover a large portion of Pennsylvania. I myself work for the York, Pennsylvania agency and we are located um, off of Laux Road. We're right close to the Chick-fil-A. Um, I know everyone knows where the Chick-fil-A is, so it's pretty easy. <laughs> it's good to have landmarks. It is, it is. I know that that's beneficial for myself. Um, but we can be reached uh, via phone 717. 845-8599, option two. Um, but one of the cool things is we're not just a, a nine through uh, nine through five practice or office. Uh, we are available 24 seven. So if anyone has any need, they can call that phone number and an awake nurse will answer that phone. And I believe uh, the wait time currently is 16 seconds until somebody answers that phone that they can help you. That's wonderful. Kelly, thank you so much for going through these important issues. I think a lot of people will, will get a lot out of the conversation and uh, best wishes to you uh, with your work. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate giving me the time.